We're running AC on the track. Why is AC preferred? I'm going to stop that in a minute because I don't want to talk over his little bell, but I'll let him go a little more. Okay, we're going to pull your power. Okay. That's what AC looks like right here. An alternating current does just that. It goes from positive to negative through zero right here 60 times a second. You've heard of 60 cycle AC. So it does this. And that's what's on this track. As a matter of fact, if I take the trolley off and I'm going to take this little truck, turn the power back on, you notice that both LEDs just lit. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a green and a blue LED right here. Those LEDs are wired back to back. The anode is of one is on one rail, the anode of the other is on the other rail. So if they're both lighting, they both must be getting DC. Well, why? Because one of them is picking up the DC that's high on this side and the other one when it's on this side. Now, what happens when this thing hits a diode? I'm going to roll this down and when I get down to the diode here, what happens? Green light went out. Why? Because the AC has been cut. It now looks like this. It's only above the zero line. It's called half wave AC. Hit it again. If yet the diode is in the other direction, it's underneath the line. But is there power still getting to that end of the track? Yes. Not as much. And if you watch carefully, the lights got a little dimmer. But they didn't go out. Instead of getting full wave AC, it's getting half wave this way or this way that I can still use. And I can also put a circuit inside of that that detects just like that LED. And basically it says if the LED goes out, oh, I must have gotten to the end of the line, do something. Ring a bell and time it and reverse. Okay. Any questions up to there? Because that's a key concept. I don't know if it's particularly unique, but at least I like it. Again, you can still draw power for lights and sound. Uses any old AC supply. This is an old Lionel transformer. Uh, if that one happened to fail, <laughs> which I kind of expected it to, this is a transformer from the inside of an old uh, uninterruptible power supply, a UPS, that puts out about 14 volt AC. It works beautifully. All right, let's continue. Now, how are we going to change the operation of this thing? What I'd like to do now, I've got the trolley off of there. I'm going to use just the frame from a center cab switcher because it's a lot easier for me to work with. Let me turn that off, put this guy on. And he doesn't have any sound, so it's a lot easier for me that way too. Okay, let's turn this back on. You see the blue LED flashing? That's telling me the version number. And it's going to pause for a minute. And with a little bit of luck, it'll take off. There it goes. Hit the little cart. And it's going to reverse. Now the question that I posed is how am I going to control it? In other words, once I've got that thing in the trolley, how am I going to tell it to go faster or to go slower or to do all sorts of other things? There's a sensor in there that reacts to this. And here's a different version. This is just a standard TV remote control. And what's, what? I've got a bad connection down here. Let me start them up here for a minute. This little guy right here made him stop. And now he ran into there. Let me just get him to stop here for a minute. I'll show you one other thing with this. Okay. If I press the enter button on this remote control and right now press number one, watch what happens. It's going to flash. It flashed twice, then fast quickly, quickly, which means 200. It's set, its speed is now set at, what, at 200 out of 255. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to tell it to go one, three, Zero. Let's see what happens. Is it going more slowly? It is. And let's do that again. Whoop, got to get its attention. Let's do one. It tells me the speed. Let's go now to zero. Whoop. Let's try that again. 
it's going to flash out one, three, zero, which is what it was. I'm going to hit zero. Let's try nine. You have to let it go nine times. Zero. Much slower as it continues. So all of the control is done with the TV remote control. We're going to do that with a pickaxe in a couple minutes. Did you notice it stopped? Why? That little piece of plastic up on top is sending out an infrared remote code that says do a station stop. It's doing the same thing that I would be doing with this handheld part and that one is sending one out that says reverse. So we've taken care of power with AC. We've taken care of station stops and the neat thing about the station stops is that little device that's telling it to reverse is about the size of my thumbnail. That's what it's doing it. And there's a jumper on it. You can have the jumper either on or off. If the jumper's on, it says reverse. If the jumper's off, it says do a station stop. And it'll take power right from the track. AC or DC power. Questions up to there? Okay. And I'm going to stop that so it's not distracting everybody. If I can catch it. There we go. Okay. This is the sensor that's on that board that actually receives the infrared. And the cool part, I can use it to set maximum speed. I can set it to do the rate of deceleration. You may have noticed when it gets to the end, it stops pretty quickly because I've got a fairly short track. I could have it stop so gradually it might take four or five feet to come to a complete stop if I had more track. I can also tell it, okay, at the end of the track, I want you to wait for 15 seconds before you reverse. Or at a station stop, I want you to wait for five seconds before you continue on your way. The infrared beacons, there's a picture of one of the little bitty things. Control station stops, anywhere on the line, power from the tracker batteries. Okay, I'm going to skip that. All right, so this is what I've been working on for the last couple months, and I decided it'd be kind of neat to show folks, but I'd also like to take and have you learn how you can build one of these things, or at least something very similar, using a pickaxe microcontroller. As I mentioned earlier, the entire introductory seminar is on YouTube. If you go to DaveBodner.com or TrainElectronics.com, you'll find a link to presentations that will take you to those videos. Question? Yeah. Yes? Those station stops, do they have to be overhead? No, no. On the trolley, they'd be underneath. Well, I can't get it off very easily. Here. Yeah. But just anywhere where, where it can access the infrared sensor. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, because the infrared sensor on the trolley is underneath. Okay. So you would put that under the track. I put them up here because on this test machine, the infrared sensor is on top. Oh, okay. It's also Very easier for you guys to see what's going on. If I had them under the track, you couldn't see them at all. And I, I don't know exactly how waterproof they're going to be. I think if you potted them in epoxy, they'd probably last quite a long time outside. Now, to work with a pickaxe, and I guess I should digress here for just a minute because everybody has not seen one of these seminars before. What is a pickaxe? It's a microcontroller. Many of them are the size of my little fingernail. The one we're going to work out with today is about twice that big. It's a device that can be programmed with a computer to do an amazing array of different things. If any of you work with either a sound card or a revolution controller or a DCC controller or any of those fancy things, somewhere on that circuit board that you're working with is a controller very similar to what we're talking about today. In order to work with one of these little chips to make it do what you want it to do, you need a few things. You need a computer with a serial port or if you don't have a serial port, that's that little nine pin thing that they used to have on all computers, your mouse used to plug into it. If you don't have that, you can use what's called a USB to serial converter, which is uh, on the table somewhere. Here, one of these little things, we'll talk more about that in a minute. You need a Windows-based computer and the slowest, oldest, junkiest laptop or desktop that you can come up with will work just fine. It doesn't need much power. So if you've got an old laptop that's sitting in the closet or know somebody that has one and it has a serial port, you're almost done. If it doesn't, you need one of these little guys. 
You need a power source, three AA batteries. How many volts does that give you? Four and a half if they're alkalines. If you're working with NICADs or nickel metal hydrides, use four of them. That gives you 4.8. As long as you're under five volts, you're okay. And first of the tips, this is the USB to serial adapter. It comes from this company, Deal Extreme. Uh, they're in China. I've got the 410 kind of shaded out. That's what they were the last time I talked. I checked a couple weeks ago. They're down to 377, including shipping. I buy them five at a time because I do fry them. I do things you would not be doing, and I'll wind up putting 12 volts into this, and bad things happen, so I buy a bunch of them. But uh, works beautifully, beautifully. 